I'm Ursula Wolves and I'm in the computer science department and also teach in the interactive multimedia program. Um, I've been doing virtual worlds, games kinds of things for almost 30 years now and this was an opportunity to bring a group of faculty together from around the college to do interactive multimedia and multidisciplinary media and our real goal here was to try to create an upper level experience for students from a variety of disciplines within the, the venue of gaming. Um, my reason for wanting this to happen was that computer scientists notoriously build very good <coughs> logic for games but absolutely horrible visuals and, and sound. I'm Kim Pearson. I teach in the English department in the interactive multimedia program and my role in the video game curriculum project was uh, to contribute some information on interactive storytelling to the grant, to do some workshops and with the uh, students on storytelling, on technical writing, and on the social and ethical implications of games. I also tried to help with the development of the website. I'm Phil Sanders. Um, I teach 3D animation, interactive multimedia, digital media types of things. I'm currently the coordinator of the interactive multimedia major in the uh, media program. And I guess my particular interests are in collaboration, interactivity, uh, and intelligent media. I'm Chris Alt. I teach in the interactive multimedia program. I just started in the fall, so I was a little late coming on board in terms of the whole games curriculum. The discussion had been advanced a lot before I even got here. Um, but during the fall, I, I got on board by um, having a, coming in and doing a guest lecture in Ursula's class about game controllers and things like that. Um, in the second semester, I actually co-taught along with Ursula and Teresa when we were actually trying to get the game produced. And in that respect, I supervised the, uh, the visual art team and also the story team. And I'm Teresa Nakra, and I teach in the music department here. I teach music theory and technology. And my role has been to advise and uh, shepherd and coddle and motivate the, uh, the audio team. So to, to um, work directly with the composer and the audio sound designers to design a compelling and supportive uh, role for audio and music in the game. Uh, one of the goals that we've had for years is to try to create situations in which students in particular disciplines are exposed to the people outside their disciplines with whom they have to work in the real world. And one of the problems often when writers, artists, programmers um, are expected to collaborate in the real world is that they don't have this appreciation for the complexity of the job that that other person has to do, the importance of respecting how that that other person needs to receive your product in order to be able to do something with it and make you look good. What happened and what was exciting to see happen is them sort of developing their own process, not following this roadmap of the industry, but figuring out what worked for them and almost figuring it out and revising it from one week to another. Um, most gaming programs are either firmly entrenched in a school of art or firmly entrenched in um, a department of computer science. Um, what we came up with was a very large graphic of the different strands that were important to um, developing a game and out of that grew a year-long agenda which we were able to follow pretty well this past year despite um, last-minute um, registration of students and some confusion about whether we could even bring students in in the fall. Um, as a result of that, we had um, about 20 students in the fall semester. Um, they were primarily interactive multimedia majors with a few art majors and computer science majors sprinkled in. 
and um, in that semester we developed a game design and built some assets and tried to define some pipelines and in the spring semester we implemented the game with 21 students about two-thirds of whom are IM majors and the other third um, computer scientists along with one musician and an English major. There were issues that we we probably anticipated but but couldn't kind of couldn't know exactly how to respond to it until it happened in terms of kind of group dynamics and scheduling and project management and that sort of stuff. Um, and to an extent it was valuable for the students to be able to kind of work through that process on their own. But also I can say that there was a number, there were a number of kind of real technical nuts and bolts problems in terms of the kind of pipeline of going from sort of speaking in, in terms of the visual art from the concept art sort of phase to the modeling and animating to the actual implementation into the game. Uh, it's fascinating to watch, for me, to watch these students talk about this game that they're creating in terms of this huge store of games that they all have in common that they've all played before and they really just kind of bounce these ideas around just as if they were sitting around having a conversation about movies which it's kind of eye-opening to me. I'm certainly not well-versed enough in the world of games to, to, to do that myself, but it's interesting just to hear these students just kind of kick back and talk about characters and styles and storylines and interactivity from these games that they've been playing their whole lives. One of the things I loved about teaching this year is that they had to perform genuinely, is that one thing a lot of students, good students in particular, develop early on is a set of skills that show off what they can do where genuine learning may not have taken place or where they have very good coping mechanisms in terms of, of explaining to you why they didn't finish something or why they can't do something or what that covering for the fact that they are clueless. And this environment was ruthless about not tolerating that. And so it was a much more genuine experience than a, a, a classroom that's teacher-centered, or even a classroom that, that had a very guided approach to bringing people through a, a process. The open-endedness of it and, and the accountability were something that we only began to understand near the end of the semester. Uh, my name is John Stouter. Uh, I am senior IMM student. Technically I am the director of the game um, so it kind of for our purposes is uh, like the role of like lead artist and head writer kind of rolled into one so I'm kind of overseeing the art side of things and the story side of things all at once. Uh, the whole, the, probably the hardest thing we're running into is it's constantly a fight against time. Uh, I think a lot of us would agree that um, number one, there's not enough time to really devote to the project as we want, but beyond that, that um, I don't know, we could have been better prepared last semester coming into this one. You know, maybe we came in with a bit of a time deficit, so we've been fighting that the whole time. Um, bottlenecks, when you have to you have specific people on a pipeline. So it's just constantly been fighting time, and uh, I hope that we're going to resolve it by uh, getting people to get their work in, and uh, having a couple of us probably have to spend a, a little, a little more time than usual working on things before the end of the semester. I thought this; I didn't realize as much, um, like kind of bureaucratic talking, and, you know, negotiating, kind of, uh, yeah keeping people on task and things like that. For some reason it didn't enter my head that I would be responsible for that kind of a thing, like, you know, kind of making sure people had their work in on time and things like that. Um, so I've been doing a lot more of that than I thought I would, and a lot, I guess a lot less of the actual um, creative stuff uh, than I had imagined. Uh, it's been a very, uh, it's been a very good learning experience, this entire project. Um, I'm not sure, uh, how fantastic a game we'll have, hopefully, while well, so many people will like to play. For future classes, uh, if 
you're running the same sort of model we did where first semester in the fall was sort of pre-production and then we actually go into production in the spring, I would say start production in the fall uh, towards the end. Actually try and get some sort of demo or some sort of, uh, try and get your, your pipeline in place for turning over assets and kind of have your, your key people for your programming, your art, your story kind of in place then and there. So when you come into the spring, you can jump right into working and not really have to worry about, you know, am I, you know, having people kind of jockeying for this position or that position and it's just wasted time. So anything and everything you can do to maximize um, time given. I'm Jason Unterman. I am a senior and I'm a computer science major, interactive multimedia minor. Um, my role in this project is I pretty much collect all the information that everyone completes. They get, they figure stuff out. I put it all together so I can present for the class. I also am, uh, I am kind of like the guy to go between the art and the tech guys. So I help figure out all the stuff that the art people have to do. I show them the rules that they have to follow so it works correctly, and I teach them how to work the system. Uh, pretty much the most difficult conflict that I ran into was figuring out how to make a mod and just just finding, just doing research on all of the different aspects that we want to create and put into the mod. There was a lot of discussion very early about what type of game we were going to do and how much story was going to be involved and what type of technology we were going to use. And that sort of filtered down to the point where it looked like the best type of game that we wanted to work with was an interactive role playing game. And Half-Life is not an interactive role-playing game. It's essentially a first-person shooter. But with the technology that we had available to us in the time, in the time we had available to us, um, it was really necessary to modify a game engine rather than to try and create a new one. But to take a <laughs> to take this like really major commercial structure and to repurpose it, I think is a fairly new uh, thing to have happen. The major accomplishments with the game itself were, one, um, we accomplished Chris's goal of completely changing the look, that raw, very precise look from Half-Life, and creating a more cartoony feel to it. Um, one of the things that John Nordlinger was pleased with was how we pulled Half-Life elements in, like the water. Um, the other accomplishment we have is we are probably doing state-of-the-art music in the game that um, I now hear it in my sleep. But beyond that, um, everyone has been really impressed with the, the level of, of, of the sophistication of, of the music and also the, the sound work we've done. When I'm creating, and I think this goes for a lot of artists, um, I have music on in the background. And that sort of serves to yeah. kind of set the mood and also kind of keep me on track and I've talked about like staying staying really vigilant and loyal to the story we've had. David's music was really in line with the story mm -hmm. and I think having him come in every week, every other week and play a little bit of this music really kind of set the mood of the room and so when you've got the animators in the room and, and the storytellers in the room and even the programmers in the room hearing this every week as they're working or before they're working, I think in a way it kind of helps to keep us on task a little bit. Well, we did a real intense, um, focused look at film music and game music and uh, took him through Star Wars type thematic development, sort of, you know, learning the John Williams style of uh, writing music for action, or, you know, and, and he liked uh, other different composers whose names are escaping me right now. And so we, we, had, there, we, had, we had spent several months analyzing film music and having him learn about what it means to write a theme for a character. And after doing that in the abstract for the fall, he was then primed to do that for our game. And, and so you know, by, by having that special time to himself, um, it gave him some specialized role in the spring where he sort of, we sort of just said, hi everybody, here's your composer for the game. And uh, I think, you know, some students 
embrace that. And some students said, gosh, I wish I was the composer for the game. <laughs> but David had this very specialized skill that he had spent the entire fall, at, you know, as well as many years prior, learning how to compose and, and to focus on this. So, so then he had the task of taking the characters, Joel and Maddie, and uh, all the other sort of secondary characters, and writing thematic ideas for each one, short melodies, and then extending them so that they would support um, a general section of the game. So there are at least six or seven basic thematic pieces that were meant to underscore the action of those particular characters or those locations. Can you at least go play with your doll somewhere else? Doll? Doll? I'll have you know that Boz here is a, a, a fully art, uh, what's the word? Articulated plush action doll. There were experiences like that with the, the animators as well. Sometimes the animators came in with, with very, very rich um, polygonal figures, and we had to break it to them that there was no way this was going to be rendered in a 3D real-time game. Um, there were also times when people would come in with, with looks and feels that didn't quite fit, and a couple of people would have to gently explain to them that this isn't really what we were after. Um, some of the tech guys seemed to think at the beginning, you know, we don't need to build all this stuff from scratch. There are, are swing sets and teeter-totters and, and, and all these things already in Half-Life. But it was re-rendering them into the look and feel that we were, we were after that was important. One of the elements of the game that is um, pushing the envelope is the movement from um, first-person perspective, where all you see is the view, to um, third-person perspective where your character is moving in front of you and that was a, a technical um, accomplishment of some of the CS students. Um, the other technical accomplishment that I didn't fully appreciate until this weekend at Microsoft is just getting in there and completely redoing Half-Life. Um, apparently in a course no one's gone out and done that before. Um, the fact that we have two levels that are implemented and that you can play also appears to be something that isn't um, readily available from other people's experience. Um, the fact that we had a, a, a large group, nearly the whole class, 21 students, working on a single game is something that no one else is doing. Most classes split them up into teams of anywhere from three to 10 people. Um, and so you might have two artists and uh, computer scientists working together. Um, the other wonderful outcome is the emphasis on story, that most other um, upper level games courses We'll talk about artists and computer scientists, but they won't talk about artists, writers, musicians, and computer scientists. And um, so that was one of our good outcomes.